A reading from Amos. This is what the Lord God showed me. The Lord was standing beside a wall built with a plumb line, with a plumb line in his hand. And the Lord said to me, Amos, what do you see? And I said, a plumb line. Then the Lord said, see, I am setting a plumb line in the midst of my people Israel. I will never again pass them by. The high places of Isaac shall be made desolate and the sanctuaries of Israel shall be laid waste, and I will rise against the house of Jeroboam with the sword. Then Amaziah, the priest of Bethel, sent to King Jeroboam of Israel, saying, Amos has conspired against you in the very center of the house of Israel. The land is not able to hear all his words, to bear all his words. For thus Amos has said, Jeroboam shall die by the sword, and Israel must go into exile away from this land. And Amaziah said to Amos, O seer, go, flee away to the land of Judah. Earn your bread there and prophesy there, but never again prophesy at Bethel, for it is the king's sanctuary and it is a temple of the kingdom. Then Amos answered Amaziah, I am no prophet, nor a prophet's son, but I am a herdsman, and a dresser of sycamore trees. And the Lord took me from the following flock. And the Lord said to me, Go, prophesy to my people Israel. The word of the Lord. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. In a campaign speech in 2004, Vice President Dick Cheney said that the choice in that election was between President Bush's optimism and John Kerry's pessimism. A few days later, Mary Beth Cahill, Senator Kerry's campaign manager, released a statement saying that the choice of John Edwards as a running mate demonstrated that the Kerry campaign is about optimism. Now, I don't re remember whether or not Ralph Nader's campaign is a proclamation on his optimism or not, but I bet he probably did at the time. I mean, everybody wants to be optimistic, right? And why not? Optimism makes us feel good. Now, of course, we all know people for whom every silver lining has a dark cloud. But let's be honest. Who wants to be around someone who is negative all the time? I mean, life is hard enough. Why dwell on the negative? Why not look on the bright side of life, if you will? Well, the writer of our first reading this morning, Amos, took pessimism to new and deeper depths. Amos considered that it was his mission to announce judge, God's judgment to all. And boy, he fulfilled that mission in blistering terms. The first words out of Amos' mouth was that the Lord roars like a lion. That the roar of God was so powerful, so fearful, that it scorched the pasture lands and dries the top of Mount Carmel. In other words, Amos preaches on behalf of an angry God. Then Amos dives right in. Damascus, here are your sins. Tyre, here are your sins. Judah, here are your sins. Israel, here are your sins. In other words, Amos flunked out of charm school. In one of his sermons, he addressed a group of rich society women. Now, usually, of course, when you are speaking to a crowd like that, you, you want to break the ice in some way, shape, or form. Here's how Amos broke the ice. He said, Hear this, you cows of Bashan. Yeah, people really love being referred to as cows. Now, the book of Amos doesn't tell us exactly how the women of Bashan responded to Amos' sermon, but I think we can all guess, can't we? 
And don't worry, I will not be asking an Amos character to cover for me when I take my planned sabbatical next year. So you're, I think you're all safe. Now here in the, in the passage we just heard this morning, Amos predicts that King Jeroboam would die a violent death and Israel would be defeated and taken into exile. In other words, this was not a happy, happy, joy, joy kind of sermon. Now, the irony of all this is that Amos' ministry came at a time when Israel was pretty optimistic. Jeroboam, Jeroboam was a great king after a long series of kingly losers. And before him, for 200 years, Israel had watched its economy, its, its international influence, its military might all go down. And after all, you and I well know what, how, how it is living with modern financial challenges. So imagine 200 years of tough economic times. But now with Jeroboam on the throne, things were different. Jeroboam had pulled everything together. He was a military leader who got Damascus back for Israel. He boosted the economy so much that people could, could start building their dream homes. homes. I mean, archaeological um, um, excavations covering that time period show houses that were built with imported Phoenician ivory. Everything, everything seemed to be going so well. And everyone was really optimistic. And then, out of nowhere came Amos. And he was about as welcome as mosquitoes at a picnic. Nobody, and I mean nobody, wanted to hear what Amos was saying because Amos was pointing fingers. And the first finger that Amos pointed to was to people, well, frankly, like me. Okay? You see, he suddenly de declares, quote, now, I'm not a prophet. I'm not a prophet's son. In other words, Amos was not professional clergy. He says he was an, a, an agribusiness man. And he feels that Lord, the Lord told him to do the job that we professional clergy weren't doing. You see, at that time, the professional clergy were just telling people what they wanted to hear. You get on religious TV and radio, you, you hear the clergy doing the same thing. Amos felt that the professional clergy was simply just too optimistic. And he felt that optimism swept too many things under the rug. And he felt he was called to speak up for those who had no voice. Amos felt called to stand up for the people that nobody else noticed. When he wanted to defend the poor, he cried out against those who, quote, trample the head of the poor into the dust of the earth. When he wanted to point out the problem of the court system, he accused the officials of pushing the afflicted out of the way. Now, as you can probably gather, Amos was not very popular. Everybody wanted Amos to, to put it kindly, to just shut up and go away. Well, he told everybody he had a vision. And in this vision, the Lord is holding a plumb line up to Israel, uh, you know, an instrument to see if the wall is straight or not. But, Amos, but in Amos' vision, Israel is so crooked, it is so corrupt, that God was going to tear it down. Well, as you can imagine, that was the last straw. The people of Israel and the regular clergy had had enough. They were not going to listen to this stuff anymore. So a man by the name of Amaziah draws a, the short stick, and which made it his job to go tell Amos to, well, just shut up. So Amaziah goes to Amos and tells him, okay, see your boy. You, you with your visions, go back to where you came from. Go peddle your religion somewhere else. Now, Amaziah can't refute what Amos says, but he wants Amos to just simply go away. 
Again, what did Amos do? Amos to announce to Israel that its society was so far gone that God would destroy them. Amos called upon them and us, by translation, to actually look at our sins, even if we would rather look the other way. Amos called upon us to look at how we respond to poverty, how the rich treat the poor, and how our court system treats all people. But of course, Amaziah didn't want to hear any of it. So he chased Amos off. Amaziah chased Amos off. But Amos, he got the last word. Wouldn't you know it, his predictions all came true. God did use the Assyrians to destroy the nation of Israel. The rich didn't get a chance to live in those fancy schmancy houses with the imported ivory. And you know, that comes to us, that shows up that there's a problem with the word of God. See, the problem is we can't contain the word of God. We can't ignore it. Well, we can't ignore it forever. God's word has a way of pushing us past the barriers we try to put up. We cannot run and hide from it. We can't chase it off. See, what we hear from Amos is even if we try to ignore our sins, our own individual sins, even our national sins, God's word will find us out. And God's word is not always optimistic. If optimism means ignoring what's wrong or looking the other way just so that we can all kind of feel good. God's word calls us to be honest. Honest about ourselves. Honest about our sins. But, and there's always a but, but, If God's word does not always offer optimism, God's word always, always, always does offer to us grace and hope. Grace and hope through the saving power of our Lord and Savior Jesus, who is, who was, and who always will be the Christ. Amen.